audible. Zoom. Can I be heard? Yes, we oh. hear you well. Okay, good. Thanks. Oh. As I don't know if I should wait another minute for latecomers, because several people who usually come aren't there. Are there any, <clears throat> does anybody want to ask any questions about anything I've said or anything related up to now, or also people on, on Zoom? Or do I just start? So maybe I should start with an announcement or a correction, because First, anyway, I should remind you that this course is, uh, is 12 lectures, so six weeks, two a week. And the first eight, of which today is the last, were Tuesday and Thursday, as you obviously know, since you're here, from 4 to 5.30. But the, but the last two weeks, so the last four, I said last time, because that was written on the poster here, uh, that it was 3 to 4.30, but that was a mistake. It's been corrected in an email to people in ICTP. On the uh, MPI website, it's written correctly anyway. It was from the MPI that I was warned that there was a contradiction. So I should put this maybe in case, I think most people look at email and announcements more anyway, but just in case somebody looked at the poster, then I should say it's not 3 to 4.30. As, as written on the poster. So starting next Monday, so today's Thursday, so in four days, the course will be at 2, 2 to 3.30. This room was not available at other times. That's the reason for the, for the shift. So I wanted to tell two, uh, I have two topics that I wanted to talk about today. I hope I have time to more or less finish both of them. So today is number eight. Today's topics, well, both of them are in various uh, guises about rapidly divergent series. So you have a formal power series, but it does not converge for any x at all. So the coefficients blow up more than exponentially. And in the first part, I'll talk about the case, which is the most frequent case by far, when it's uh, factorial divergence, so like n factorial. And then in, this, in the second part, I'll talk about more general classes. And there, amusingly, so first I'll be talking about series. So I'm talking about divergent series. I typically will write the variable as h to remind you of Planck's constant. Uh, the physicists and topologists often put h bar because it reminds you even more. Because you know, h, there are many h's in mathematics, like my h was 8. There's only one h bar. But in the actual applications, in not theory, this h was naturally 2 pi uh, or 2 pi i times another constant. So I call that one h bar and this one h. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is, so this is a formal power series. Might be with rational coefficients. Or it doesn't really matter. Let's say complex coefficients. But a and typically, in the first part, remember we had more generally n factorial to the alpha, beta to the n, n to the gamma times c0 plus c1 over n. This was the kind of thing that we were trying to interpolate. But this is the case when alpha is 1. So that's what I'll talk about first. And then I'll talk second about this when alpha is bigger than 1. And surprisingly, some phenomena are different and actually easier. Or certain things are true for alpha bigger than 1 that simply aren't true in the factorial divergent case. But also, the problem that we'll be addressing is quite different. Here we want to know about asymptotic, so for instance, the inverse power series, that kind of thing. Whereas here, we want to know about evaluating the series. So the first question is, if I have, well, I mean, the question for the first uh, half of the lecture, so this first topic, is if I have a series like that, and for the moment, I'll be assuming that it is this kind of behavior, so just a single n factorial, how to evaluate this numerically? So you get an actual number. Now, obviously, if h is 3, that makes no sense at all. I and mean, the terms are just absolutely huge right, for, right from the beginning. But if h is 
of one millionth, then the first few terms, the h to the n is rapidly decreasing, and the ans are just fixed constants. You get a nice power series in one over h, and so you get a good approximation. And so the question is, how can you actually make some sort of numerical sense to high precision of this number? But you don't expect to get an exact number is the answer. You expect to get a number which is well-defined up to a certain precision. So the completely naive is just truncate. Uh, so f let's call it fixed truncation. So then you can certainly say 5h is approximately the sum from n from 0 to, let's say, 20, just to say a random number. Well, it's exactly equal to this, plus O of h to the 21. So if I simply, if I've computed the first 100 coefficients of my divergence series, and they're divergent, then I can just decide that's how we usually define power series, as limits of polynomials. So we just approximate it by a polynomial or truncate it, and then say the error is h to the 21. So if h is 1,000, this should be 10 to the minus 63. But of course, we have a factor in front, a20. And so if it's factorial the divergent, it may longer, no longer be 10 to the minus 63, but maybe 10 to the 20 times 10 to the minus 63. So, uh, so this is an O, but of course, this O depends, I'll put O sub 20. If I chose, it's, it's a fixed number, but if I would take more coefficients, then typically the, I mean, this is of the order of the next term, a n plus 1. It's here a21, but that's growing like 21 factorial. So it's a very big O. So what we actually want to do as a first approximation is optimal truncation. So we stop when a n h to the n is roughly minimal. So the idea is here's a, I, I make a graph, here's n, and here's a n h to the n, let's pretend everything is positive. At the beginning, these terms are getting exponentially smaller because they're like h to the n. So if h is a tenth, well, here h is a half, this would be like a half, a quarter, and eighth. So they're getting exponentially smaller up to a while. But of course, eventually, they're, they're growing exponentially because a n is like n factorial. And so there will be some value of n where it's the smallest possible. And you just stop there. and You see it on the computer, or if you know the asymptotics like this, of course, you can compute a priori where it happens. And so this is what you do that's sort of the naive approach that's certainly done in physics, I mean, where the H is maybe Planck's constant, it's some other fine structure constant, some other parameter which is small. And typically, uh, this is an asymptotic, a pertur perturbative expansion. Maybe each a n is given by a sum of certain uh, loop uh, Feynman diagrams with n loops. And anyway, you can't compute very many a n because if n is large, there are many too many diagrams, and each one is very hard to compute. So maybe you only know a small number of words. So of course, if you only know six terms, there's nothing to discuss. You just take the six you know and hope for the best. So this, in physics, for instance, is used to compute the magnetic moment of the electron. That's a famous calculation where the Feynman diagram calculations and the experiments agreed to, I forget how many decimal digits, maybe 13 or 15, anyway, to very high precision. But here we want to uh, take this optimal truncation. So let's assume that this is my asymptotics. And here, the next comment just, uh, uh, so the, uh, the details of how to do this, by the way, I should say, were worked out in the joint work of which uh, I gave a whole course last year on various parts of this work. And it's leading to a series of many papers. So. Uh, one, one or two papers are already out. This part isn't out, but it's written up, but, but not yet uh, on the archive. So we worked this out for specific applications where these things were the expansions of certain quantum invariants of knots. I might give an example of that later if I get around to it, if there's enough time. Otherwise, I'll leave it out. But I talked about that in quite a bit of detail in my course, the CISA course last year, and some of the people are the same. And so, and the numerical aspects of how to do that for the quantum invariance is in the paper which came out on the archive three or four months ago. So I probably won't say too much, but I did want to mention that thinking this through was all joint work with Stavros. So coming back to this, uh, so we, we're going to assume this, and here I, I started the sentence, and then I, I, I might as well assume that beta is one. 
Because, of course, if you have a series of integers, you, you care about the exponential growth. But if I just rescale a n by dividing by beta to the n, obviously I'm just rescaling h by factor beta. And if, if h is small, so is beta h. It's just a renaming of the variable. So I could, uh, I could schlep it around the whole time and keep the beta, but let me not bother. So I'll assume beta is 1. OK, so, well, now what, what does that mean? To look when it's maximal, you have to look, of course, at the ratio of, let's say, uh, the nth term to the n minus first term. So a n has a factor n factorial, so that'll give me an n. The beta, I could have kept it, would have been beta n. So I'll put it here, but uh, as I say, I'm going to assume it's 1 anyway. And then n to the gamma over n minus 1 to the gamma is just 1 to leading order, but h to the n over h to the n minus 1 is, of course, h. And so you see that this should be essentially 1, because at the minimum, it, it's going down and then it's going up. So the ratio is less than 1 until it becomes, starts being bigger than 1. And that's the point where you should stop. So therefore, we should stop. Uh, so the stopping stop at n equals n, which should be, well, according to this formula, it would be 1 over beta h, but since I've uh, uh, decided to set beta equal to 1, I simply stop at 1 over h, or more correctly, 1 over absolute value of h, because, of course, you might well need this for a complex parameter, or more to the point the h might even be real, but the beta that I had originally might be complex, and so when I rescale. So h, in general, is a complex parameter, and, of course, this thing was with the absolute value, whereas n is already positive. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. So this I'll call optimal truncation. And that's the sort of obvious thing. And at first sight, you would think that's the best you can do. So n is equal to h inverse plus o of 1, a n h to the n. Now, this has several disadvantages. One, of course, is it's not completely well defined because o of 1 could be, well, it couldn't, we couldn't take it to be exactly 0 because, of course, absolute value of h inverse may not be an integer. But it's, it's some large real number. So we can take n to be 1 over the absolute value of h plus b, where b is a real constant, and it's of the order of 1. Of course, if you want, you could always take it between minus a half and a half. So I can choose a rule for where to stop. Like I take the ceiling of this number, the next, the, the smallest integer bigger than it, or the floor, the biggest integer smaller than it, or the rounded number, the nearest integer, where even in that case, if it's exactly a in, uh, half integer, you have to decide you take the one below or the one above. But it's obviously a little arbitrary. So the problem is the choice is a little a choice of stopping time, of stopping value is, uh, is, is, not, is uh, kind of arbitrary. As I say, you can fix a rule to have if you want a well-defined function. But whatever you do, let's say that I take the rule, I take the floor of n over h, so the biggest integer, the integer part. But still, that, it, that will go up continuously, n over h, as, uh, as h decreases, and then, uh, sorry, 1 over h, and then at some point, it'll jump to the next integer. So at some point, I'll be taking 83 terms in the series, and for some smaller h, I'll be taking 84 terms. And so at that point, I've, th there's going to be a jump. So if I took the sum up to 83 terms, I'd have an error term, which is maybe getting smaller. And if I took the sum for 84 terms, I'd have some other term, error term, which would be doing whatever it does. But uh, at some point, you jump from one to the other. So that's the thing we want to compensate so that we get something that works. However, already this gives the expected error here. Well, of course, we don't know what the error is. First of all, it doesn't even make sense, because when I say the error, I mean the difference between my numerical approximation and the true value. But we don't know what the true value is. We don't know how to define it. There can be many different functions of h, which are perfectly good C infinity functions at 0, but have exactly the same asymptotic expansion to all orders. For instance, you could add e to the minus 1 over h. And so that would have a different value at a particular h. So it's not even quite well defined. But in practice, most functions that come up you believe that there is actually a true function somewhere in the background, and this is the asymptotic expansion of a, of a canonically kind of a God-given C 
a smooth function. And sometimes it really is that. You start with a function that you only know asymptotically. And so the function is well-defined. And you can compare the actual value of the function, the small h, with the value you get in this way. But you will never be able to do better than roughly e to the minus n, where n is, again, 1 over h. And the reason for that is simply the following. If I change my mind by 1n, so instead of stopping at n, you know, n0, I stop at n0 plus 1, then I've changed this sum by the, n, the nth term. But here you see that if I take what the actual nth term is, we just checked when it's a minimum. But this is approximately n factorial. Well, there's a gamma to the n. I don't really even care about it so much, n to the gamma. So there's an n factorial, n to the gamma, because of our asymptotics, and a constant c0 that I really don't care about. But then we have to, uh, we're dividing by h to the n. We're multiplying by h to the n. And h is roughly 1 over n. So it's roughly n to the n. And so forgetting uh, unimportant things like the constant, the n to the gamma, by Stirling's formula, we know that this is roughly, sorry, this should have been capital N, because it's at the point where you reach the minimum, which is capital N. Then you see this is by Stirling's formula, roughly n to the n over e to the n. This is n to the n, and so this is roughly e to the minus n, as I said. So you certainly can't do better than that, because even if there is a true function out there, you take this error. As you move along and the value of n something jumps by 1, the value of this sum will jump by e to the minus n. So even the function you get as h goes to infinity will, will have jumped. So if there is a smooth function uh, and this thing has jumped by 10 to the minus 10, then at least one of the errors has to be at least half of 10 to the minus 10. So you definitely can't do better than that. But in practice, you expect to get about that. I mean, times the small power of n. It will depend on gamma and sterling. There's a one n to the one half from sterling and so on. That's not important. So that gives an exponentially good error. And that's, of course, much better than n to the minus 20. So here, if I stop, if this is called n, then this error will be h to the minus n, uh, which is you know, a, a, fixed, uh, a fixed power of n, whereas here we have e to the minus I mean, it, it, n is not given. It's h which is given. So this is roughly exponentially big, exponentially small in 1 over h. So it's much, much better than any power of h. So this works fine in practice. And in an example that I was going to do in detail, I've prepared, but since it, it's kind of a red herring for this course, and I did it last year in detail, so some of you have seen. And anyway, it's the, those uh, experiments are in the paper. I can give, say, which page or something. I think I'll skip how it actually worked. But there was a case where we knew uh, the coefficients, let's say dozens or 50 or 100, 200 coefficients of such a power series. But we had an actual function that was supposed to be asymptotically equal to it. That was a true function. But when you took the difference, we kind of expected that there was a second series, a n to, uh, prime h to the n, where this had a similar behavior, but with a smaller, uh, with a different constant, a different beta. And uh, which mean, would mean a different stopping point itself. And so with, the, with just to power, translation, uh, power truncation, you couldn't see the second term at all. With the optimal truncation, you could see it. And you could uniquely do So this series was one we predicted. And there was a specific coefficient, which we didn't know. But we expected a multiple of a particular function, uh, some power series. And you could actually do this and get that constant to 20 digits and recognize it was, in one case, it was squared of 3 to 20 digits and so on. But then, actually, there was a third power series which had yet a slower growth, a smaller order of growth. Actually, to be more honest, what we actually had was a certain constant over h times some sum a n h to the n, let's call it c, where this is very big. Then we had another one, that, and we knew what c and c prime and the a n and a n prime, at least the first few hundred, but there were actually three terms that we expected, I mean, from the analysis. And C was bigger than C prime, bigger than C double prime. So this thing, if you just truncate at a finite point, it's completely drowned by this. This is, we'd say, suppressed. I mean, I could take out the factor e to the C over h. Then here, the error would be a power of h, and here would be exponentially small. But now we've improved that the error here is exponentially small also, and we were lucky that exponent, e to the minus n, was, uh, it was a bigger exponent, so a bigger negative power of n, 
than the difference between C and C prime. And therefore, we could see there was supposed to be a coefficient here that we had to find, actually. We had uh, infinitely many such series. And we could actually find this coefficient numerically to very high precision. But then, when we subtracted that, we wanted the next. But the next one, the error in this naive optimal truncation, was better than the difference between C prime and C, but not as good as the difference between C double prime C. So you simply couldn't see this last term. Because even with the optimal truncation, the error was exponentially smaller than the main term, but it was exponentially bigger than the third term. We were lucky it was smaller than the second term. We actually had many examples. Sometimes you could see three terms, and, and the fourth you couldn't see. So that's when we thought if you could improve this. And actually, the idea is very uh, uh, easy. So we have a thing we call smooth truncation. So, so we again take uh, n, which is going to be 1 over h. Uh, plus b, where b is of the order of 1 in real, uh, a and h to the n. But then there's an error term. Now I have to check my notation so that I don't get uh, contradictions with the notation. Uh, so if you imagine b as a fixed number, let's say b is 0.3. It's a fixed O of 1 number. Well, if b is 0.3, then since n is an inch, or let's say h is roughly 1,000th, then if h is roughly 0, 0, 001, and if b is, let's say, 0 0.3, then n might be 1,000.3, or it might be 1,001.3, or it might be 999.3, etc. So if I fix b, then all that's happening, uh, as, I, uh, as I change my, my h and make a new choice, this dependence on b, I, want, I would ideally like this, if this were an actual function, this would be an exact form. The epsilon b would be error. And then you see immediately that epsilon b plus 1 of, of uh, sorry, this should be, uh, this would be, uh, yes, if I call it h or n, it doesn't matter. Whatever I call it, we'll maybe get the notations right. I can't read my handwriting. I copied everything, and now I can't quite read it. It's epsilon b of h. That makes more sense. After all, it's h, which is given, not n. n is the thing we're choosing. So this correction term that I want to add should have the property that epsilon b of h is equal to epsilon of b plus exactly a n h to the n, where n, remember, once again, is 1 over h plus b. So if I could solve this equation exactly, so if I could invent some epsilon b, which is a well-defined function uh, for every real number b, let's say of the order of 1, uh, so it's a function on the real line in b, and it's a function of, of a parameter h. If I could solve this enclosed form for my given a n, where n, remember, is given by this formula, then, of course, I could simply add that to this, and the sum would be completely independent of where I stopped. I could change from b to b plus 1. So remember, the problem is, I'm adding the first term, the second term, the third, and I'm stopping after, let's say, 83 terms. But if I move a little further, suddenly I have to take 84 terms. So at that point, it's going to jump. And I don't want it to jump. That's why we call it optimal smooth truncation. I want to make it smooth. So what I would like is that this is at least true to all orders in H, because that would mean, it, or at least to the first few orders, that would mean that when I take my jump, there was a jump, but now I've added this epsilon to it, and now the, the, the modified function will no longer jump. I get something which is smooth. And then you would expect that the error term is not the size of that term, but much, much later. And that's indeed what, what happens. So if you write that out and think what it means, uh, so let me write so that I don't have to keep writing uh, 1 over h. Let me call that capital X. So this is going to infinity except that there's a subtlety. And the subtlety is that x may be, it's going to infinity in the sense that its absolute value is going to infinity. But it actually matters what the phase is. So I write it as a phase, a complex number of absolute value 1 times x. x is going to infinity, and mu is some phase. So now if I do this, then by Stirling's formula, we see that the, this is what I just did a moment ago, but now more precisely. There's a full asymptotic expansion. Well, I can actually give the first few terms. It's mu, this phase, to the power minus n. So that's the number of absolute value 1, but it does depend on n. And then from Stirling, you get 2 pi 
e to the minus x, that's what we had before, the e to the minus n. Remember, n is very close to b. And then here, it's x, uh, actually, I think it's gamma plus a half. In my notes, it's a half minus gamma, but we've changed the sign of gamma. So uh, let me just see if I got the, the sign right. Yeah. So ignoring, uh, this is just absolute value 1. That's a constant. This is some small part of x. That's the e to the minus x that we had. But actually, uh, it's equal by Stirling's formula. That's only the leading term. But Stirling's formula gives you an entire asymptotic expansion. And in terms of our original c0, c1, and c2 that we had, it'll now be uh, an expansion in 1 over absolute value of x. Starts with c0, which was our constant. That's the leading term. But now there's a correction uh, in c0. I mean, it's linear, of course, so it's c0 times something. It's c0 over 2 times b squared minus c0 over 2 plus b. Uh, minus c0 over 2, and I can't quite read my handwriting, but I think it's gamma plus a 12, uh, and probably that's not exactly right, plus c1, plus dot, dot, dot. So the general term will be pb, which is fixed. I mean, all these ci's are fixed, so the, the next term will be pl of uh, b, pk of b, I think I called it, divided by x to the power k. And this is a polynomial in b of degree 2k. And you can compute as many of as you want just from Stirling's formula. So we get an entire asymptotic expansion. Remember, c0, c1, and so. We assume we know. We know how the asymptotics for our series actually look. That was these numbers. I've assumed beta is 1 to keep life simple. And so we have you know, precise asymptotic expansion. And so this is the one that we want to be equal to epsilon b plus 1 of h minus epsilon b of h. Uh, so now you can unravel that. It takes a little bit of thinking, and it's kind of a pain in the neck. But what you find is that what you need, but now I need to, uh, maybe I'll just take the print. I wrote everything on paper, but my handwriting is so hard to read but I think I'm better off taking the printed paper and at least reading the forms correctly. So this gives you the ansatz, uh, which is in fact true, that the epsilon b of h will have the same form, the same mu to the minus n, the same square root of 2 pi e to the minus absolute value of x times, again, x to the power gamma plus a half. And then there'll be a new power series, k from 0 to infinity. Let's call it qk of b over x to the k, where these qk have to satisfy the following very nice equation. Because of the phase, because of this mu to the n, when you, when you put this into the equation here, remember we had epsilon b plus 1 epsilon b. b is fixed, but when I change by 1, I change n by 1, I pick up a factor of mu. And so the expression that you have to solve, I mean, the q will depend on mu too, but I'm not going to write that. So it's a power series. Actually, it's a function of polynomial in B. Uh, and of, well, it's not polynomial in mu. You'll see in a second, but it's a function of mu. So what we need is the following functional equation. I'm not going to write the mu. And this should be exactly P of B, PK of B. But now you see that's very nice, because it, P of B is some explicit polynomial. I wrote the first two here. Let me check if I didn't have, no, I think actually this was plus and the gamma should have been, well, it should have been well, plus and then minus gamma. It doesn't matter, plus C1, it's some polynomial. Now when you work out the Qs, then you can do it completely explicitly. If mu is not one, then there's no problem because this is a polynomial. It's a combination of terms B to the J. So if I make this also a polynomial, the top term will have a B to the J but it'll be mu times that minus 1. And so I have to divide by mu minus 1. And I can do that. And then I can subtract that off and get the next term. And so it's a completely well-defined procedure. And you get you know, as many terms as you need. And it starts like this. Q0 will be the C0 over mu minus 1. So remember, P0 was just C0. But P0, P1 
is already c0 of 2b squared minus c0 of 2b. So the next one, q1, will again have degree 2. It's c0 over 2 times mu minus 1 times b squared. Well, there are uh, about 10 more terms. I'm not going to write them out, but you can trivially find the unique polynomial in b, which uh, satisfies this recursion where pk, p2 of b, is the specific quadratic polynomial. And it's also a quadratic polynomial. So here, the degree of qk of b is, again, 2k. And so that's very nice, because it means you have an asymptotic expansion uh, of epsilon. I don't know where I wrote it. Uh, where's the definition? This was the, this was the thing that we were approximating. But somewhere I wrote, uh, here it is the, uh, the asymptotic expansion of epsilon b of k. And you can compute as many of these qbs, qk of b, as you want. And so let's say I take 20 of them. If I take, if I use q0 up to q, q uh, let's say capital K, which might be 20, then the new error is now roughly up to a fixed power of x, which I don't care. It's e to the minus x that I already had times x to the power of minus 20. That's a lot bigger. I mean, if, if h was 1,000th, then x is 1,000 to 1,000 to the 20. I've gained a factor of 10 to the 60. So that's not, not hey, it's, it's, it's very nice. Now, you could say, or you should say, what happens if mu is 1? And then you see, this equation makes no sense. All of the coefficients are polynomials in b, mu, and 1 over mu minus 1. But if mu is 1, of course, 1 over mu minus 1 is infinite. But now I have that qk of b plus 1 minus qk of b is a known polynomial. Then qk of b uh, has to have degree 1 bigger. QK, uh, qk of b uh, is now 2k plus 1. But there's an ambiguity of a constant. Because, of course, if I add to each given k some constant, then it, because mu is 1, it just drops out. So therefore, I don't have quite a well-defined procedure. So the next question, since it very often happens that your numbers are all positive, you definitely don't want to exclude the case when x was already positive, rather than having a face. Remember what I'm doing? I have my mu, which is somewhere on the unit circle. Here's mu. This is 1. And then my x, I'm assuming, is that phase times an absolute value, which is going to infinity. But if x is going to plus infinity, which it often does if, if all the coefficients are positive and h is positive, then, of course, mu is 1, and so I actually want that case. But it turns out that even apart from that, there's a better way to do it, which is much smoother and will give us a, uh, a nicer formula. So a better way, I'll keep the beta now just to remind you, but I'm going to set it equal to 1 in a minute. Replace the asymptotic expansion that I had, uh, which was you know, some beta to the n times n factorial times uh, n to the gamma times c0 plus c1 over n plus c2 over n squared. See, one thing that's a mess about that, this is a combination of two kinds of functions. This is a gamma function, gamma of n plus 1. If you think of n as smooth, but this is a power function, and they don't really fit together. But what you could say is what this really is, is gamma of n plus 1 plus gamma. So what I could do, so I replace this, a n is equal to this, by a n has the asymptotic expansion to all orders. And then I'll have a c 0 prime plus a c 1. Well, c 0 prime will actually be the same, plus c 1 prime over n. I can have an equally good asymptotic expansion, but I've combined. Uh, now, I can keep the beta to the end, but as I already said, it's not. Excuse me. Replace a n approximately this by a n approximately this. And again, I can rescale and assume beta is 1. So that's better, but it's still not good for exactly the same reason. Here, I didn't like multiplying n factorial by n to the gamma. What makes sense with n factorial is to multiply not by n, but by n plus 1. Then it's n plus 1 factorial. That's the functional equation. So for the same reason, I've now improved the n factorial n to the gamma by a gamma function, which is smooth. But now I have gamma divided by n, which is nothing at all. But of course, uh, this, I could put c0 double prime. This one will actually be equal to c0. This will also be c0. And then, uh, but instead of doing it like that, I'll keep that first term, c0 double prime, plus c1 double prime of gamma of n minus gamma plus c2 double prime 
times gamma of n minus 1 minus gamma and so on, is just as good as an asymptotic expansion. So in other words, I don't write the thing as the product of a predetermined n factorial times powers of 1 over k, but I shift the n by integers, or because if I had the end of the gamma, I actually shift by gamma first, and then by integers, okay? And th this has the advantage, the analysis will be much smoother, and also if I did the other, it would depend separate, separate on two different real parameters, but now it only depends on the combination. So now once you do this, uh, it will be uniform in, in this uh, thing, gamma. So that's what I'm going to do. And the other advantage is that the actual ones that come up when you do asymptotics, like for these quantum invariants, very, very often, the form of the asymptotic expansion that you got was, it came out in this form. You got one term like this, then the next term was the next smaller gamma, and so on. Of course, you can always translate. There's a complete, you can write down in closed form, uh, for instance, C1, this will still be C0, this will still be C1 prime, I think, because the first term will be the same, the next one will be a, a combination of C1 prime and C2 prime. They're completely equivalent, but this one is much smoother. And so this is the one I want to use. And so if I call that lambda, so my new ansatz for the an, uh, so now we're going to assume that an has the asymptotic expansion. Now there's no particular reason uh, to put the double prime. I'll just call them ck. So they're new ck's times gamma of n plus lambda minus k, where lambda was originally 1 plus gamma. Well, it was 1 plus gamma in the original notation, but this is my new ansatz. Again, there could be a beta to the end, but I can leave it out. So it's actually much smoother. There aren't so many constants instead of a beta to the end and the end of the gamma and something. There's just a single shift. Lambda is the only parameter, and we're writing this as a combination of a big shifted factorial and then shifted by one less, you know, one below that, and so on. So we're writing our thing as a linear combination of these asymptotically large functions. Okay, so if I do that, then uh, with this new notation and the same mu as before, what you find that you need now is, so now phi, phi h, you know, this, this is a smooth thing for a given b, so I'm, I'm fixing b. So this will be the sum n from 0 to capital N, which once again, n plus b is going to be 1 over h, or, b, or 1 over beta h, but I've set beta equal to 1. So it's this. Uh, so it's the original power series. That I'm not allowed to change. It's the coefficients that I have a different description. This is the same. But then what you find now is that each C of L will give you h to the power L minus this fixed number lambda times a new thing. And that's very nice because we already had one parameter. Before we had one, two parameters, we had only one. Now there would have been three parameters in the original way, but now there's only a second one. Because as I shift by one at a time, uh, I'm going to have a certain function, a universal function, epsilon sub d prime of one over h. So a power series, uh, which will be a power series in H. And, but it, it no longer depends on B and lambda separately. It only depends on B minus lambda. So I've, I have less things to compute. I have only one kind of universal function. So that sentence was hard to follow, but I'll write down what, uh, what I need, where E B of X. So remember, B is a real number of the order of 1. X is very large with a given phase mu, which we'll have to worry, this of the order of one and maybe real, uh, should satisfy, should satisfy in principle exactly, or to all orders of approximation, but in principle I can do it exactly. This is a, I have the same phase factors before, and then it's very similar to the thing I had before with Q of B plus one times mu minus Q of B, but now it's epsilon B of X, of, sorry, X minus epsilon B, is exactly on the nose, gamma of x minus b over x to the power x minus b. And the exact details doesn't matter. But now it only depends on a single parameter which I've called b, but it wasn't originally b. It will be b minus the lambda, which was 1 plus gamma, plus some integer, so it'll keep changing. But I can just call it b since it's an index of some new function. So now we've produced 
the problem of how to add a, a, a nice smoothing term to the problem of finding a function that satisfies this equation. So now there are two approaches. I'll say them very briefly, and then I think I'll stop on this theme. we we'll just say a couple of refinements. Well, I'm going to explain so how to find, how to compute, how to find this epsilon b of x. Let's say either numerically to very high uh, accuracy as an exact function or as an asymptotic series in 1 over x, which typically will be good enough because x is large with asymptotic series anyway. And you can do both. But one small comment that we make in the paper, you only have to do it once. Here you have epsilon, the initial term is b shifted by this fixed number lambda, b minus lambda. But then we're going to need that, which is going to be a lot of work to compute. But then we'll need the next one, which is that b plus 1. But that you don't have to compute again, because once you're epsilon b uh, for some b, then you, this is an exact function. Your computer knows the gamma function. Then you know e b plus 1 as well. So once you have the first one, you're in, you're in good shape. So you only have to compute 1 to high accuracy. As I said, that could be as an exact number or as a power series in, in 1 over x. So if you do it as a power series in 1 over x, so the, uh, the power, uh, power series approach or asymptotic, you use again Sterling for the nth time, so x is going to infinity. Here there's no mu in this form. It only depends on absolute value of x and, of course, on this b. And so by Sterling, to all orders, this is the square root of 2 pi over x times e to the minus x times, well, I can actually write down exactly what it is. This is the sum, i from 1 to infinity, of the i plus first Bernoulli number evaluated at b plus 1, if there are no mistakes here, times i times i plus 1 times x to the minus i. But of course, you can multiply this thing all out. And what you'll get is 1 plus, I'll again call it p1 of b over x plus p2 of b over x squared, et cetera. It's a perfectly good asymptotic expansion. You can find as many terms as you want. p0 is, of course, 1. p1 is b squared over 2 plus b over 2 plus, uh, plus uh, six, uh, 12. And p2, I have all of the terms here. I'll just give the first and the last. It's a fourth degree polynomial, which starts b to the fourth over 8 and ends 1 over 288. So you have these b's. And now we do exactly the same as we did before. We make an ansatz that we want. This is a, a fact. The epsilon b, this is an ansatz. We assume that it is, in fact, a, a theorem, that it is like that. It's exactly the same leading term. But now, to, to all orders, and now there's some new polynomial, uh, qk, of b, which, of course, depends on mu just as it did before, x to the k. And there's an equation exactly like there was before. In fact, it's the same one. So when you do this, you can immediately find all of the q's unless mu is 1. And so that gives you an expansion. But there is a cuter way. And so let me say that just very briefly. And then I'll make a few more comments about how you use this in practice. And then I'll go on to the other theme. So the idea is that we can write Yeah, the point is we want mu, I'll write again the functional equation that we're trying to solve. Remember that x is a fixed phase times a number which is going to infinity. So we have this is supposed to be, and then I write out the gamma function in closed form. And that's what Euler found is a formula for an integral formula for the gamma function. So if you look at the formula that I had here, and you just substitute that thing and rescale, then what you find is t minus mu, where mu is this phase factor. So you see that there would be a problem. Mu is, remember, on the complex, uh, on this uh, unit circle, and I'm integrating from 0 to infinity. So there will be a problem if, if mu is 1. But for the moment, let's say mu is, is not 1. OK? Well, this you can solve kind of completely trivially in closed form. Uh, I think you can solve it. You just write down the, the solution. Sorry, I've already written down the solution. Uh, I, I made a mistake. The gamma function is this thing with just one, with, without the t minus mu. And what I've done 
is to just solve this. It's a geometric series. So it's, sorry, this was supposed to be, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sleepy and I'm writing the wrong thing. Epsilon B of X, it's still written here. I don't have to copy it as this. This one you write as a very simple integral, zero to infinity of the other. And then you can, you can solve this equation in the integrand, and you can, you can do it immediately. And that's what I, I wrote the right answer with the wrong question. So this is what Epsilon B of X is, at least if mu is different from one. Then you can just write down this actual integral. It's a perfectly convergent integral. You can compute it by numerical integration, or you can also expand in powers of x by the method of stationary phase. And if you do that, then if mu is different from 1, you'll get exactly the same qk that we got by recursively from the function equation. But you can also do this to any accuracy, just as an actual integral, and get this as an exact function. And I'll just put maybe Cauchy principal value if mu equals 1, so you integrate as usual up to, if mu is 1, you integrate up to 1 minus epsilon and from 1 plus epsilon, and then that combined integral, so you integrate from t equals 0 up to 1 minus epsilon, you skip 1, and then you start again at 1 plus epsilon with the same epsilon, go to infinity, and the limit of that is epsilon goes to infinity, as you all know, is the Cauchy principal value. It's a well-defined function, and you can compute it numerically or in any way you want. So that's basically what you do. But the advantage of doing it this way is that this is now an exact function. When I did it before with the sum qk of b, this is, of course, again factorially divergent. You can even estimate this again goes like k factorial. So this wouldn't be exact. But it doesn't bother you because remember I said before that even if you stopped here at 20 terms, uh, then you still are gaining a factor uh, x to the minus k, uh, 20. But how here, we, because this itself is asymptotically convergent, I can do it again. So that's the second level of truncation. I can replace this uh, by, the, by the summed function. So I take more and more terms. And then with this particular smoothing, so you stop this series when, the, when this term is of the same order of that. Or you can even repeat it and use smooth truncation on that too if you have enough information about the QK. But using this, well, sorry, the, I'm not writing this well because I didn't write the uh, key thing. Sorry, I wrote uh, I don't even know if I, if I wrote the formula. I'm sure I did. But le let me write once again what I'm doing because I th I'm sure you've lost the thread a little. And even I had. The 5H smooth is the optimal, the initial truncation you sum to this capital N, you just take the first capital N terms, where this is again, uh, you know, the usual N plus B is uh, uh, 1 over H, which I'm uh, sorry, is 1 over H, which is what I'm calling X. But then we have to add, I think, I'm sure I did write this, but it's the sum, L greater than or equal to zero, and then the CLs that I have. Remember, these are the new CLs. I'm assuming that my AN is now uh, C0 after change notation times the shift of gamma plus C1 times the shift of gamma at the argument one less, and so on. That was my assumption. So I have these new expansion coefficients, and then each one separately. I, th I think I did write it, but if I didn't, I apologize. I may have skipped a line. Uh, it's a, a specific power series. No, I, I, I know I did write it because I remember talking about this b minus lambda plus l of 1 over h. So, uh, so we have this expansion, and this is now an exact function. So we can, uh, like with this integral, we can assume we know it to all precision. But of course, this series now will again diverge. So it's not that series. This one also diverges, but this function I can get exactly. So this is exact if I use the integral representation. But here, of course, this is divergent, so I have to stop at some capital L. And then the error that I make, I've gained a factor h to the L, that h is 1 over x. So that is what I said before, that I somehow, there, it's not the x to the k, it's, uh, it's this x to the L. So I've gained a power. But now I can do exactly the same thing in practice, since the CLs grow factorially, even if I don't know enough to know their full uh, form, if I combine the notion of the CLs with this, I can actually do the next stage, use the same optimal truncation, and therefore I can choose L optimally. So if I choose L optimally, 
then this gives me uh, 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 you know, the opt uh, optimal smooth truncation, as it were. That's the best you can do by this method. And when you do that, you can do the analysis. I'm not going to. For one thing, I don't have the notes, and it's not interesting. You find that the new error, remember the old error was a constant, uh, which in my normalization of the beta was 1, was simply 1 over h. But the new error will be some other constant, c, and c will be strictly bigger than 1. So you, you don't just gain a power, you, you gain an exponential factor, but it's a specific one, and that's all we know how to do. You could do a third one by doing it again on this, but first of all, it's very complicated. We never tried. And secondly, there are uh, earlier papers by uh, uh, especially Michael Berry, Dingle, and uh, somebody's name I didn't know, Howells, and they have do something of the same general sort. It's much more specific. It's for a specific series. But they discovered that if you try to keep iterating the procedure, you get an exponentially good term, a better one, a better one, but there's a limit. You don't get you know, an arbitrary e to the minus lambda over h for any lambda. The lambda stop, and, and there's not that much percentage going on. So therefore, you can do the second truncation. So the final formula will be this. So we have n terms, which is of the order of 1 over h, and l terms. And it turns out that n is, well, it's exactly 1 over h. But L is some other constant that you can compute in terms of everything else. I don't remember. So we have a second correction term, which is much smaller. Remember, this thing is already as small as e to the minus n. So therefore, this is already corrected and exponentially small. The next one is a better exponential. And then you stop. And then the final thing is that once you do this, you see when L was fixed, let's say L is 3. Well, let's start L is zero, capital L is 0 or even minus 1. You haven't done this. Then we know that you have to take the n to be exactly, remember, 1 over h plus b, where b is a fixed number. But it, now it turns out you don't have to do that. Once you're going to add a correction term, and it's a very big correction term with the same order of magnitude of terms as that one, you can sometimes go to a later stopping point or earlier. I forget which way. So the optimal stopping point, if you let n be some constant 1 over over h, and n2 to be some constant 2 over h. Then when c2 was chosen, it was pre-chosen to be 0, so we weren't going to do that one at all. Then c, this only value for c1 was 1. But if you change c2, make the little, you know, you take different values, then it turns out c1 changes, and the total error, you can make work out the total error, you can optimize not by the original stopping point. So the final step is that you stop not at the place where the original terms are smallest, but where the terms together with the truncated correction, uh, the total error is the smallest. And then it turns out you gain another exponential. So you get a, th a third. We already have with simple optimal truncation roughly e to the minus uh, x. Then we had e to the minus something bigger than 1, c bigger than 1 times x. And if you do this, you'll actually get a c double prime, which is bigger than c times x. And we worked this out in some examples. I don't want to go into it more. This is really a main subject of this course, but it's kind of, uh, it's very much about asymptotics, and it's also about using the kind of series uh, functions that we were approximating before to recognize the asymptotics, that it was you know, some n factorial times some beta to the n, n to the gamma, et cetera. Now we're assuming we found the asymptotics, but only to many terms, and we want to numerically evaluate this power series. OK, so that was my first topic, and I want to come to the second. I have a little more than half an hour left, so I can give it at least some treatment, probably not say everything. So now I want to talk about the case when it's general. So let's imagine series. Again, I'm going to be looking at power series. Uh, I think I've very slightly changed the, uh, where this was the truncation story. Here I want to assume that I have, uh, so I'm going to be looking at power series like we had before, some a n, you know, some variable, maybe x to the n. And the a n will again be of the type the most important, as always, is the power of n factorial. The next most important is the exponential. The next is important is this. And again, you might want to write it differently with the single gamma function shifted, as I did before. So if I assume that I've something like that, this is called something like, so I'll call the set of functions 
that are O of this. So if I just put O of the same thing, let me call that class S of alpha, beta, gamma. This is called the, some Gevray class. You look at all power series with a given alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha, of course, should be positive. We want the coefficients to be increasing. Typically, beta should certainly, well, in typical examples, it's positive. Gamma is, uh, could be positive or negative. So you look at functions that are O of n factorial to the alpha. And you look at the class of such functions. So this is the set of all such functions, uh, a n x to the n. It's a little vague, uh, where a n satisfies such an asymptotic expansion. And this class is uh, obviously closed under addition. It's a vector space. If I've O, it's closed under multiplication. For alpha positive, that's still relatively easy. But it's not closed under other operations. So I don't want to really be quite this specific. And I mean, I, I, I could. So we have, well, I'll do it exactly as in the paper. This, by the way, is from the paper with Dawei Chen several years ago, Martin Miller. Well, it's not so many years ago, I think 2018. Martin Miller and myself. So that it's a published paper. And in the last section, or an appendix maybe, we discuss these functions of very rapid decay. So here you can take, if I don't care about the beta, I just take S of alpha beta, it's the union of all S of alpha beta gamma over all gamma. So I, I just say it's O of this for some gamma. So I fix the exponential. Simply S of alpha is the union over beta of S of alpha beta. And then finally, we had a class called S asymptotic of <coughs> alpha and beta. And these are functions that have a power series n factorial to the alpha beta at the end. But you don't want to fix the gamma, because then you wouldn't have even a, power, uh, even a vector space, because you know, if you subtract things, the order can drop. You just have a power of an expansion in distinct powers of, of you know, 1 over n. But not to worry too much. There were three or four different classes. And then the, the theorem says that if alpha is bigger than 1, part of it is true even if alpha is positive. Alpha equals 1 is the case I've been discussing today the whole time, simply factorial divergent. But if alpha is bigger than 1, alpha equals 2 is, of course, the most common. So now we're talking about the series, the simplest test case, I'll just call this f of x, would be the sum n factorial squared x to the n. So that's more diverged than what we did before. What I said before wouldn't apply here. That was specifically for factorials. So now if alpha is bigger than 1, then it turns out that each of these, so it's a little proposition or a theorem, each of these classes, s alpha, s alpha beta, s alpha beta gamma, and the asymptotic one, each class is closed under various operations. And the operations are, first of all, addition. So if f of x and g of x have expansions of that sort, then you can form their, product, their sum. Multiplication, so f of x times g of x. Now, uh, composition. So this is g of f of x, where now, of course, you have to assume that f of x starts with a non-zero constant, which you can normalize to be 1 by normal. We, we, we don't care about the first coefficient. It's the asymptotics for the large coefficients. So I'm saying if you have a, power, a function whose nth coefficient grows roughly like n factorial, let's say, squared, so some number bigger than 1, and you have another one which also grows at most like n factorial squared, the leading coefficient is x. Then when you do the composition, it still is n factorial squared. It's always going to be the same alpha and even the same beta. OK? And then uh, uh, it's also powers. So f of x to some power, lambda. Of course, if, f, if lambda is a positive integer, you can just do that by iteration for this. And then most interesting is inversion. So again, if f is an invertible power series, f inverse of x will have power coefficients of the same order. That's simply not true if alpha is 1. And it's kind of obvious, because uh, we could take a really simple, uh, is it obvious that you? I think it, now I can't think of an easy example. But it's simply not true. If you have a power series, f of x, and it, its coefficients grow like n factorial, not n factorial to a bigger power, then the inverse power series might have much smaller coefficients. I mean, there's, uh, I think you, it, it's simply not true. So, but it is true if alpha is bigger than 1. And that's kind of a surprising thing, I mean, even intellectually, why it's easier to deal with the rarer case when you have extremely rapidly divergent 
series, so they're presumed even harder to evaluate in any intelligent way numerically. But as far as working with them as formal power series, it's actually very good. So let me give, I mean, I'll just give a few bits. The whole appendix is 12 pages or something. I'm not going to give everything. So let me write a n factorial as maybe I'll drop, well, I can keep the, uh, so I'm, I have n factorial to the alpha, beta to the n. I'm not fixing the gamma, remember. When I did the asymptotic class, I had to let the gamma be a variable. But I'm fixing alpha and beta, and let me call what's left a n tilde. So this will be of the order O of n to some power. So we now have coefficients that grow sort of normally. Then let me take the example. If f of x is the sum a n x to the n, and g of x is the sum, say, b n x to the n, and f of x times g of x is the sum c n x to the n, then, of course, c n is the sum a uh, uh, m times b n minus m. But if I do it for the modified ones, after I've taken up this factor, then what I'll get is the sum m from 0 to n. And now let the, the binomial coefficient to the power minus alpha. The, the beta at the n part drops out because n, n is the sum of m and n minus m. But the n factor all to the alpha gives you a binomial coefficient. So we get a convolution, but it's a kind of a twisted convolution. Now, what happens is this. I mean, how big is n, n over m? Of course, it's it's at most 2 to the n, because the sum of all the binomial coefficients is 2 to the n. So these coefficients in the middle are very, very small. But at the edge, they start, and it's roughly 1 to the minus alpha, n to the minus alpha, n to the minus 2 alpha, and the same at the other end, when, when m is near. So at the end points, this factor starts of the order of 1. So if I do the small terms, this will start with uh, you know, a0, which is just a number, times b n tilde. Then a1 tilde is another number, but it's now divided by n to the alpha, which is a little smaller, b n minus 1 tilde, et cetera. And then plus, that's the beginning, and then some stuff of the same sort at the other end. But the things in the middle will be very small, because this binomial coefficient is roughly 2 to the n to some fixed positive power. That will be completely negligible. Remember, the growth of these ais is only like a power. So therefore, you can compute the exact asymptotics by taking the, this is just, these are just numbers that you know. And this, you know the exact asymptotics. And so you can work out the asymptotics at the beginning. And each term is negligible compared to its predecessors. You get a contribution from the end, from the beginning, and from the end, roughly. OK? So, but when you compose, then it's much, much more interesting. And inverse is actually related to composition. I'll more or less skip it, but it is true. So let's think of composition now. So actually, I'm going to change my notation slightly. I'm going to let this be n0 to infinity, n x to the n. But I'm going to assume a0 is 1. So before, when I composed, I wanted something that started with s. I'm going to take g of x, and sorry, g is some other power series. Of course, the sum bk x to the k. And then I'm going to take the sum, I'm going to take g of x times f of x. So this will be the sum of some uh, uh, cn. Yeah. OK? And then, of course, if you just substitute this, then you obviously see that cn is just the sum, k from 1 to infinity, but it stops at n. Otherwise, the coefficient will, the further coefficient will be 0. And now it's just the combination of these b, uh, sorry, this is bk. Uh, it's just that, where a n minus k is defined, if I take the k power of this, then I'll call those coefficients a n k. So this is, of course, so far just a triviality. I've substituted what it means to compose. OK? So of course, that you can do completely explicitly. So if, if you. If you do that, so the sum, the first few, I mean, the first finally many, you can work out exactly what they are, because the sum x to the n is just the power series of 1 plus a1x plus a2x squared, uh, sorry, uh, et cetera, to the kth power. And so this is just some power series, 1 plus k a1 
x plus you know, something else times x squared, you can obviously work out as many terms. So if you fix n, of course, there's a, a fixed finite formula for a n, a n k. But what we need in order to see how this whole thing grows, and this is where it now gets interesting and kind of fun, we need to make estimates. And there'll be a crude estimate and then a much better estimate after. So I, I want to make me concentrate on that because that's the mathematically interesting thing that happens. So once again, I'm fixing the notation. I have a power series, some a n x to the n, where for convenience, a 0 is 1. And I define new sequences, a n k, so it depends on two indices, as the nth coefficient of the kth power of that original one. And so we have to define it. So, we, the, the, so here's a proposition. It's called the lemma in the appendix. Uh, let's assume, since I'm assuming it's O, if a n is bounded, I'll make the constant exactly 1 by n factorial to the alpha. I mean, th then we have a discussion if you have a constant of power of n. But let's keep it simple. So if a n is bounded by n factorial to the alpha for all uh, n greater than or equal to 0, and alpha here is allowed to be 1, but not smaller the moment, OK? Then the claim is that a n k, we have two different estimates. And sometimes one is better than the other, and sometimes the other is better. So one of them is a constant to the power k uh, times uh, sorry, to the power k minus 1 times n factorial to the alpha. And the other is also uh, n factorial to the alpha. But here, it's a binomial coefficient, n plus k minus 1 over either n or k minus 1, whichever you prefer. So. So we have these two things. So the, the proof is, is very easy. It's the same proof. Remember that I was using a n tilde k to be the same a n k. I'm in the class, the very class of power alpha. There's no beta and no gamma here. I just divide by n factorial to the alpha. So I have two things to prove. I've showed that this is bounded. I mean, for k equals 1, by definition, it's simply less than or equal to 1, because that was my assumption here. So the constant is 1 if k is 1. So it's quite reasonable here to have a k minus 1. And I've showed that this uh, renormalized thing is bounded by both the k minus first power of, of a certain constant uh, and then this polynomial. And c is a well-defined function. I'll say what it is in a second. But the two most interesting cases are 1 and 2. And the numbers are 8 thirds and 9 quarters. So in particular, if I take the case of n factorial squared, which will be my test case in a moment, this bound would say it grows at most exponentially like n over 4 to the k minus 1. So uh, now I can tell you what c of alpha is. c of alpha is the maximum over all integers n greater than or equal to 1. And then we take the same sum we had before. I take the binomial coefficients, but then to the power minus alpha. And then it's easy to see that if n is very large, that tends to 2. But if it's smaller, it's, it's bigger. Anyway, it's, it's a number which is reached. The thing goes up, and then it goes down. Uh, and so there is a well-defined maximum, which is a specific value of this. It's always attained for some n. OK, well, let me actually prove this, because it's short and, and sweet. So uh, if, we, if I take the uh, a n, the, the recursion, but then I'm going to divide by all of the tildes. Remember, a n tilde means I simply divide a n k by n factorial to the alpha. Then if I put absolute values, we're going to find that this is the sum. Well, it's bounded. I mean, it is the sum, but I want the absolute value. Binomial coefficient to the minus alpha, a m k, a n minus m, 1. But a n, sorry, but this is tilde, and a n tilde 1 is simply 1. I mean, this was what I just wrote, a n minus tilde 1. But this one, the absolute value is less than or equal to 1. That's exactly my assumption. So therefore, you know, well, that's what I just said. So therefore, this is less than or equal to the sum n to the m to the minus alpha times a n tilde k, 0 to n. So that's certainly true. And now I'll prove both statements by induction. So for this one, we see that by for, the, for 1 and for 2, for 1, we get that 
a n tilde k plus 1 is less than or equal to the sum n over m to the minus alpha. But now this a m tilde k was simply a universal number. It's uh, c of alpha to the k minus 1. This doesn't depend at all on n. And this sum is less than or equal to c of alpha, because that was the definition. c of alpha was the maximum of this. So this is certainly c of alpha to the k. So that proves that by induction. And the other one is uh, equally easy. Uh, you, uh, you find by induction, again, that a n tilde k plus 1, since the inductive step says that a n tilde k is at most m plus k minus 1, over k minus 1, this sum, um, this is just a trivial binomial coefficient identity. That is exactly a n plus k over n. And as a result, the thing simply duplicates. So both of these uh, things uh, are, are proved by a kind of a one-line induction. So we have this kind of stupid bound. And then from that, you can estimate the other thing. And now what happens is this. It's the same as before. When you do the thing, you have a big sum. You have terms at both ends. But if alpha is less than 1 or even 1, then the terms, at least at one end, are all of the same order of magnitude. So you can't do anything. But if alpha is 2 or, or 1.3, if it's bigger than 1, then the leading term in this sum is huge. The next term is huge, but it's less by a positive power of n. And the next is less than, by a power, than that by another power of n. And so what you get is a well-defined asymptotic expansion of the whole sum as the leading term, which is something with n factorial to the alpha, times a well-defined power series of 1 over n. And that only works if the alpha is big enough that there's no cancellation. As I said, these theorems are actually false. If alpha is 1, then one can quite easily write down counterexamples. So what I think I want to do now for the last part is find the actual asymptotics, because that's really a fun mathematical problem. And after all, this is a course about asymptotics. So what can you say? So let's define a and k like this. But now let me take the case alpha will be 2. And a n is simply n factorial squared. So I'll take the very simplest function. And so a n k is a function of n and k. And the question is, how big is it? So the bounds that we just gave, I think I just, no, I haven't erased them. One would be n factorial squared times c of 2, which I told you is 9 quarters. So it's less than 9 quarters to the power k minus 1. There's an actual inequality, not just a bound, uh, not just asymptotic. And it's also less than n factorial squared times n plus k minus 1, k minus 1. So you know, if k is something small, then uh, this, this is independent of n. And this depends on n. It's a polynomial. So this one is worse. But if k is a little bigger, then of course the exponential starts hurting you. So either of these can, can dominate the other. But both of them are very, very far from the truth. So the question now, as I say, this is the last thing that I'll do today. I have uh, 17 minutes. And I'll spend a little well, the remaining time on it without going into the discussion of the inverse power series, which is just a, a corollary of all of these estimates. And if you care about it, it's in the paper that I just gave you the reference. So, so the question is, how, what is the actual truth? How do these things actually grow? And as a test case for the particular case, n is n factorial squared. So if k is 1, that would be, by definition, a n 1. And so both of these, if k is 1, give the same number. But what happens if k is large, uh, you know, and also how large should it be for different domains. So here I think I can go back to my handwritten notes because I, maybe they'll be legible and maybe they won't. So I'll try. So we had the, these two bounds that we already had, 9 fourths to the k minus 1 n factorial squared and n plus k minus 1 over k minus 1 k factorial squared. So first, let's first think of n fixed, uh, fixed and, well, I was going to say small. Of course, every fixed number is small as other things go to infinity. So then the sum a n k x to the n. So now I'm looking at the first so and so many terms. Well, by definition, this is the kth power of the original sum. And the original sum is just a fixed power series whose nth coefficient is n factorial squared. And I've taken this to the kth. So as I already said before, we can, of course, multiply this out. 
and I'll write out the first uh, three terms. So it's 1 plus kx plus k squared plus 7k over 2 will actually four terms if you count the constant one. 21k squared plus 144k, I think, over 6x cubed, and so on. So we get some polynomials. And so what that means is that if I look at A3, let me take as an example this A3. So I'm going to take A3 tilde k. But remember, A3 tilde k is A3 of k divided by n factorial, which is only 6 to the k. I mean, now n is fixed. And so this will be, uh, sorry, I'm doing something wrong. It's n factorial. I'm, sorry, excuse me, I'm always dividing. No, it was right. It's a3 of k tilde, which is a3k over 6 to the I'm suddenly, can somebody help me? a3k, I'm taking 3 to be k. Maybe I should write it again. a n k will always be I divide by n factorial squared. A and K. That's right. So K is 3, so I'm divided by 6 squared. But it's this coefficient, so I'm actually dividing by 6 cubed. So it's K cubed over 6 cubed times 1 plus 21 over K plus 144 over K squared. That's an exact formula for the third coefficient after this tilde thing. But if you continue and you think about it a bit, what you find is that if N is fixed, that you'll, so n fixed and k going to infinity, then you'll find that a, well, now I don't even have to divide by tilde. I'll just leave as it was. It's going to be approximately, I'll call this first function a1 of nk. And it's defined. You can expand and take a log of and expand. It's just, it's a five-minute exercise. But the answer, I can just write out. It grows roughly like k to the n over n factorial cubed. And then, so n, remember, is fixed. For instance, n could be 3 or 5. So this is just a fixed number. This is the nth power of k. Here, the first term, we have a power series, but I take its log. It turns out it's much better to take the log. And then it starts with 1 plus 7 halves n times n minus 1 over k. But if you take the log, then all of the terms at this n, n minus 1 over k. And the next term is 994n minus 335, if I'm reading correctly, divided by 12k, and so on. So what you find is is uh, and all of these terms are small because n is fixed, and this is 1 over k, 1 over k squared, and so on. But actually, now you see that this actually makes sense if k is much bigger than n squared. So if n is much less, much less than the square root of k, then this is already small. But here, the degree will go up, and the, here the degree, and it won't work. It turns out that you actually need the n to be much less than k cubed, the k to be much less than, uh, sorry, n to be much less than k to the one third. So if n is much less than k to the one third, then even though one originally derives this by thinking of n as fixed and expanding it. That expansion makes perfectly good sense in this domain where n is less than k to the one third. OK, well, time is a little short, so I think I'll just give the other. If k is fixed and n goes to infinity, then we use what we did before. If k is fixed, remember what we're doing is we're taking 1 plus x plus 4x squared plus 36x cubed and so on to the kth power. So before, I said if I take the coefficient of x cubed or x to the 10th, that's just a polynomial in k for a fixed n. But it has this asymptotics. As I showed you, I didn't do it very well. But if n is 3 and I go back, you would see that this is k cubed over q times x of, since n is 3, this would be 2 over k times 7 halves plus. It's, it should come out exactly like what I had before, so 1 plus 7k. So for any fixed n, this will be the form of the asymptotic expansion. And as I said, it's not even fixed. You can now let n go all the way up to the cube root of k. But you can also do it the other way. If k is fixed, then I'm taking, for instance, the fifth power of this series. 
But remember, when I multiply two series, it's just a convolution. I make an easy estimate. There's a recursion. And so if you do that, you find I mean, this is another you know, four lines of calculation. I'm not going to do it. Then you find, so both of these are true statements that for n fix, this is the asymptotics. It's this completely explicit power series. I'm to all orders, but I didn't give it to all orders, but it's a power series with coefficients in uh, 1 over k with coefficients in q of n. But if you do it the other way, then the asymptotics are completely different. It's k times, it's still exponentially big in g in n. So let's call the coefficient in n g minus 1, then g 0, then g 1 over n, g 2 over n squared, and so on. So we have a completely different kind of an expansion, which looks like this. But now, k has a certain form. And again, this is going to be true. So here, I, I didn't say here. This is actually if n is less, uh, much less than, uh, so less than some small constant times k to the one third, and this is if n is considerably bigger than k to the one third. So actually, each of these, when you look at the nature of this expansion, which I'm about to write out, you find that each one makes sense as an asymptotic series, and therefore gives you uh, arbitrary precision to any given degree of accuracy in these two domains, which leave, you know, if, if you have the curve n to the one third, then if you're well to the, to the left of it, you have one expansion. If you're well to the right, you have another. So on one side, you have a1, on the other, you have a2. So I haven't yet said g minus 1, g minus 2 are. And that's actually quite uh, amusing. So the formula for g minus 1, g0. So first of all, I didn't say what this gi is. It's a universal function of the, of the quotient, k over n cubed. Remember, it's our basic parameter, because now we know that k is the sort of tricky places when k is of the order of n cubed. So in one asymptotic thing, g, this, uh, the, uh, I'll call this number t, the, uh, the argument t will be very small in one case, and you'll have the asymptotics of the gi on one side, and the other, it's the other. So here, uh, I can tell you what the first one is. j minus 1 of t is the sum when you write out the first 20 terms, and then you recognize them very easily, because it's just hypergeometric. It's the following sum, t to the n. So it's, uh, this is convergent, because 3n factorial over n factorial, 2n factorial is roughly like the binomial coefficient. So it'll converge with some radius of convergence, which I think is 4 over 27. Or I'm, I'm sure it's 4 over 27. And this is actually the algebraic function, if you know this kind of uh, binomial thing, you would see immediately it's got to be algebraic. And so I can actually tell you, it's, sorry, it's not quite algebraic, it's derivatives algebraic. So it, there's a log. So what you do is you write t as a times 1 minus a squared. This is a cubic polynomial, it's maximum between 0 and 1, it's at 4 27ths. If t is less than 4 27ths, there's a unique root a, which is between 1 and, and a third, and that's the route you have to take. So that's what g minus 1 is, and then it turns out all the others you can get in closed form in terms of a. So for instance, uh, g0 is 1 half log of 1 minus a cubed over 1 minus a cubed. All the rest are rational functions. Uh, in fact, polynomials in a1 over a, I'll just give you one of them. 7a minus 59a squared plus 191a cubed minus 204a to the fourth plus 9a to the fifth. And then it's that whole thing divided by 2 times 1 minus a squared. You see the same 7 halves we had before. That's the extreme case. 1 minus a squared times 1 minus 3a cubed. Etc. So each g2 is a well-defined rational function of this a, and so you have a completely well-defined asymptotic expansion. And now the, the final joke is, when you do this, now let's look by Stirling's form to see how big these things are. So here, this I wrote, again, I wrote it twice, this when n is much smaller than k. Well, 
k to the n by Serling's formula, I mean, sorry, n factorial by Serling's formula, you can work out. This thing is asymptotically equal to 1 over 2 pi n to the 3 halves times e cubed times t power n. So up to you know, simple power of n, it's purely ex it's exponentially n, but it's e cubed times t. And remember, t is this fixed number, which is k over n cubed. I mean, I'm, I'm, so I imagine I'm fixing t, and I'm letting k go like a multiple to n cubed. If t is very small, we're in one uh, uh, regime. If k is, t is very large, we're in the other. I may have got it backwards, um, which one I pointed at. And so t is the, is the key parameter. And so this one will grow exponentially like t. But this one here, you can read that off immediately, that uh, a2 of nk will grow like some constants, which doesn't matter what it is. I can even say what it is in terms of the same number a, which, remember, is constant. It only depends on t. It's given by that the algebraic equation, a times 1 minus a squared is t. The constant is a times 1 minus a to the 7 halves over 1 minus 3a to the 1 half. And then there's a small power n cubed. So just as here, we had a power n to the minus 3 halves. And it's, again, exponential. But now the exponential is not fixed here. Well, here it's also not fixed. It was linear. It was e cubed t. So one of them is like e cubed t. But the other is some other function, b of t. And b of t, I can write here what it is in terms of a. It's simply 1 minus a squared times e to the 3a. So at some point, these two curves will cross. And so there's going to be a t0 where, I, I don't know if I drew the, the second one correctly, there's a t0. And it's actually, so here I just said if, n or, if t is much less than 1, very small, you're in one regime, t is very big, you're in the other. But now we can be very precise. There's a specific t0. And if I take a little epsilon neighborhood, then uh, in one regime, less to the, le to the left of t0 minus epsilon, I'm in the, re in the regime uh, uh, a2. And here I'm in the regime a1. So here's t0, here's t0 minus epsilon, here's t0 plus epsilon. So it, it goes into these two, two regimes. And, uh, and the crossing point is given by the following really bizarre formula. So t0. You can't, it's always A, which is the true parameter, so I have to tell you what A0 is. So T0 will be A0 times 1 minus A0 squared. And A0, because of what I just said, is the root of uh, that this function B of T, which I just wrote out, is equal to E cubed T. And when you work that all, well, that just means for A0, like that I can write out, it's E to the 3 A0 minus 3 is equal to A0. And so if, if you, you know, do the numbers, then A0 is 0 0.059 something, and T0 uh, is 0 0.0526. Or maybe I'll give one more digit, just so it. OK, so these are some specific numbers. So you have asymptotics that make perfectly good sense. And if you look at the convergence of this, you'll find that A2 if t is in the regime where this is the form that you take, then this series will uh, have a well-defined asymptotics of one sort and the other is of the other, and you, you have everything to all orders. So the only question is what happens as they cross. And now the most naive guess would be, well, one of these is much bigger than the other on the left, and the other is much bigger than the first on the right. So let's just try a of nk. I just defined as a1 of nk plus A2 of nk, which are, of course, not well-defined numbers, but they're given by asymptotic power series expansions, which, uh, where a few terms will give you very high precision. And so now I can give you the actual numbers. So we did a little numerical experiment. I'll end with that. We took k to be 50,000. Because remember that the n is around k to the 1 third. I don't want n to be 3 or something. It should be a little big. So if n is uh, k to the 1,000, then the the crucial n0, which would be the square root of k over the t0 I just defined, is actually about 98.3, 98.29 something. So therefore, in the little table that we gave, I'll just give x, well, I mean, it's, it's, t, uh, it's several numbers, so I won't give them all. So here's n, and here I'll have a1, the 
divided by the true value, so I'm going to normalize everything, and A2 divided by the true value. So my k is always going to be 50,000, but my m will vary. And we took 80, 85, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. So we went one at a time, because that's where the number actually was happening. And then we jumped to 100. And so when you do this, I don't know how many digits there are, but I'll just write a few of them. Then you find this one is 1, and this one is 0 to you know, 8 digits or 9 digits. So indeed, it's completely dominated by A1, and the next one is 0 0.9969s. But to make up for it, this one is then 0, 0, 0, well, it's actually 4, 4, and this is 6 zeros, and then it's 5, 6. It's exactly the complement of this. When you add them, A1 plus A2, the sum of those two numbers over A and K, then to the number of digits I'm given, which I think was 11, it's exactly 1.000000, all of the digits that you need. And here again. And then as you move on, this one suddenly is no longer so dominant. This is 0 0.085. The next time, this is 0 0.458. And this is 0 0.542. But the next time, it's already 0 0.06. And this is the big one. And you see the second domain taking over. Uh, the next one, that was 92, then 93, not that it really matters, is 0, 0.00. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip to 94. This is 0. 0.000335, and this is the complementary number, 999, whatever it is, uh, 0. 0.999, a lot of nines. The numbers are in the published paper, and the final number, as you get to 100, this to, I think, 11-digit accuracy is exactly 0, and this is exactly 1. But the sum, every time, to the full accuracy of the computation is 1.00000. So it's a very amusing thing with phase change that you can pin down exactly. I'm sure one could prove all of this rigorously. We didn't try very hard, but the asymptotic expansions are well-defined. And as I say, although they're not convergent, you can compute this to many digits of accuracy. And then in each case, you find that it adds up beautifully the two. So a little to the left, the actual cutoff point was somewhere here, 98 or something. When you're well to the left of it, it's, this is everything and this is nothing. Then this is still almost nothing, but it's a little tiny thing and this is very slightly less. And when you get a little beyond T0, then it's the other way around. The first one is 0% and the other is 100%. But the sum of the two is always exactly 100%. So it's a nice a kind of acute example of the phase change. In, Asymptotics, which as I'm sure one could do rigorously. We didn't try very hard. We were just trying to get the actual information. And, and then the last word of this, the very last word, that's also written down in my handwritten notes, but before I find it, it'll be faster. So if we now actually add, so in this case, remember a and k was the coefficient of x to the n in the sum r factorial squared x to the r. So the k, that was the definition. And this was less, we know that, to some constants, mk times n factorial squared. So if I, if I, for any given k, we know that there is such a bound. And what we had before is uh, I can choose certainly 9 quarters to the k minus 1. But now if we use this new analysis, we find what mk actually is, so the old. And the new is not even an upper bound. It's an actual formula. Uh, asymptotic formula, it's e to the power 3 times k to the 1 third divided by 2 pi to the 3 halves times k to the 1 half. So the important factor is exponential in k to the 1 third, whereas this thing's exponential in k. So for k at all large, the new bound is, uh, the new form is very much better, and it's not even a bound. This is actually, it's actually equal to this plus 1 over O of k to the minus a third. So assuming everything else is true, we actually know, uh, you know how much uh, the kth power, how much it is off from just n factorial squared. It's at most this specific constant, mk. So I've gone four minutes over time. I'm sorry, but anyway, that's the end of this. So as I said, that ends the first eight weeks of the course, which are a little separate from the first other four because of the different time. 
And the last two weeks, the last four lectures, I'll spend certainly most, but maybe all of it, on a very, I think, very, very nice example of, for the, of the uh, circle method and for square partitions. In particular, and that I'll do in some detail. And if there's any time I don't need all four lectures to do that, then I'll either stop early, we uh, lecture early, or I will talk a little about these very, very, very slowly converged series, which was the third of the problem on the poster and on the announcement of the course. There was this kind of crazy sum one over n sine x to the n, which obviously converges perfectly well for every x, but the question is how do you compute it when x is very large? And so it's highly oscillatory and incredibly slowly convergent. So uh, a huge number of terms to actually get the value, even though it is convergent. So that's all for, for now. And maybe we should sign off soon so that the people running the audiovisual can go home unless there are questions from anybody, quick questions. Otherwise, maybe on Monday morning. Monday at the beginning, I mean, of the lecture. People here can ask questions if they want. Nobody seems to be asking questions anyway, so then I can uh, tell whoever's listening, maybe Marco, that uh, we can finish, we can, we can log out.